Today we're going to talk about using Swift in production. And this is something that not a lot of people have done, or if they have done it, haven't really talked about it. And I have some experience, so I want to share that with you so that we can uh, you know, grow together. So first thing I want you to do is think back to WWDC 2014. Keynote, Monday morning, the Apple executives, they're up on stage doing the normal thing. Only Apple could do this, they say. And then Craig Federighi comes up and says, what would Objective-C look like without the C? And everyone is quiet, because they know, they know something is coming, and we have Swift. Now, Objective-C without the C isn't a very accurate description of Swift. Chris Latner on the Apple Developer Forum said, saying that Swift is Objective-C without C implies that Swift is only subtractive, that they only took what existed and took bad parts out of it. But in fact, they actually added great parts to it. They took a look at existing languages, like JavaScript and Haskell and Erlang, and they took the best features out of those languages and tried to put them into Swift. So I don't like to think of Swift as Objective-C without the C. I like to think of Swift as Objective-C without the C, but with a lot of cool stuff added. So the next time you hear that, that saying, just remember, it's not Objective-C without the C, it's an objective party. All right, so we're going to go over three things today. First, we're going to talk about how awesome Swift is, which isn't really going to be difficult to convince you today because you're at a conference all about Swift. But second, we're going to talk about the tools surrounding the language and the community. Third, and most importantly, we're going to be talking about how you need to be informed and aware of the Swift community in order to make the correct decision about using Swift in your project. So let's start off with something fairly obvious, but just to make sure we're all, all on the same page. Swift is different. It is not just Objective-C with new syntax. In fact, it is quite different. As we saw from many talks earlier today, uh, Swift is very static, where Objective-C encourages you to be more dynamic. Swift prefers immutability. You, uh, you want to use things like let for constants instead of var for variables. Swift encourages the functional programming paradigms and problem solving techniques that Kyle talked about earlier. Swift is a lot safer than Objective-C, and that's really important. Uh, you know, if a user sees your application, they're using it, and it crashes, you're going to get a one-star review. Now, if you catch the code that does that crash at compile time, that is fewer bad reviews for you. And that is a better App Store rating, more sales, more money, everything. Uh, and, and finally, that's really important to me, is uh, Swift has playgrounds and it encourages experimentation, learning new things. It used to be that in order to learn how to write uh, Objective-C, you had to create a new Xcode project, and it had an app delegate, and it had a storyboard, and it had a view controller subclass, and it had an asset catalog. Now, they open up a file, they type some code, they see the results. Fantastic. To illustrate the difference between Objective-C and Swift, I want you to take a look at this code example. This is the kind of code that you would find throughout UIKit. Things like uh, UI table view delegates have a lot of these, where you want to allow optional behavior in objects that conform to this protocol. Things that aren't necessary, but uh, you know, things that could be nice to have, like reordering table view cells. Not everyone wants to do it. This code is completely valid in Objective-C, but if you try and write a pure Swift equivalent, you'll find that the compiler produces an error on that line. That's because optional functions are not accessible in Swift protocols. Instead, you have to add, yeah, this is, this is what happens when you see a compiler error. Instead, you have to add at object C to the beginning of it. I know what you're thinking. You know, that, that, that works. That compiles at least, right? But actually, it's not a very good idea. When you do this, you make babies cry. <laughs> when you put at object C in front of a protocol declaration, you're telling the compiler that this protocol must be compatible, or rather the object that conforms this protocol can be compatible with Objective C, which is nice, but it also limits you. You give up a lot of the compile time safety as well as some of the Swift features. For example, Swift structs and enums cannot conform to an Objective-C protocol. So don't just do that. Look for another way to solve your problem. Swift is better than Objective-C. This is my opinion. I think it's probably your opinion, too. 
you know, it, it's just there's so many reasons. Uh, let's look at, uh, let's take a look at some code examples. Uh, who here has written code like this? Anybody? Uh, self row at index path. You've got nested if statements and if section is this, if row is that, blah, blah, blah. It's really terrible code and it makes me want to scream when I write it and scream harder when I read it. Uh, so instead, Swift has this really cool thing called uh, a pattern matching in, in switch statements. It's a switch statement much like one in Objective-C, but it's not switching on the index path directly. Instead, we're creating a tuple made out of the index paths section and row, and then we're matching against it beneath in the case statements. This is better. This is an improvement, and we should be proud of this, but I really think that we can do better than this in Swift. This is just Objective C without the C. This is Objective Party. Here, in the first example up top, we're saying for any section zero, bind the row number to be a new variable called row. In, and then you can use row when you're configuring your cell. Or you can bind a section to be the, the uh, section variable, and then provide a where clause, and say, this case statement executes where the section is even or odd or whatever. For example, you can even call a function to make sure that this is the kind of row that you want to actually configure. This is some pretty powerful stuff. If anyone's used Haskell or anything, oh, this is it. So uh, one other thing I want to point out, and this is the kind of code that I want to see more people using on GitHub, is self-evaluating lazy closures. Uh, when you're writing view did load and then you need to add a button to your view hierarchy. Usually you need to create a new local variable, configure it, assign it to a weak property, and then add it to the, to the actual view hierarchy. That pollutes your scope with an extra variable name that you don't need, and it kind of makes your method really long, and, and we want to strive for short, concise, expressive code. In this way, we say this button variable is lazy so that it's only assigned when it's accessed for the first time, and it is equal to the result of a closure that is immediately evaluated. So this is great and something you can't really do in Objective-C. Good for you. There's lots of other great features about Swift. I don't really have time to go into all of them, but uh, we've seen some other great speakers talk about some of the great features of Swift in this conference. So let's move on. Let's talk about the tools surrounding Swift. These are the things that you need to use in order to write Swift code. And the fact of the matter is that they're not ready for production yet. If you look at the Apple tools like Xcode and Playgrounds and SourceKit, these are all unstable. And they're not just unstable because there was a beta period and they were unstable during the beta. They're still unstable. There are frustrations and delays that are going to be caused using them. You are going to run into problems that you don't anticipate and it's just going to make you want to pull out your hair and you know, we don't want that to happen. I want to talk a little bit about a project that we worked on at Artsy called Eidolon. This was an enterprise application that we needed to build from scratch starting in late August. We had the choice to use Swift and we decided to. We wanted to learn something new and we wanted to share what we learned with the rest of the community. More than that, we wanted to follow a philosophy that Artsy has been trying to do more of called open source by default. And that means that unless there is a good reason to keep something a secret, it should be open source. This is something that we really take seriously and we've open sourced another one of our iOS applications since then. Really excited to share what we learned so that you can learn from the mistakes that we made. Using Swift to build Eidolon doubled the amount of time that it took us to build it, estimated. It's, uh, <laughs> It caused some delays, and we had to send an email like this. This is not the kind of email that you want to send to your company. This is a very awkward email to send, and it's more awkward to read, and it's not happy. Some of the problems we ran into included things like code signing issues with 6.1 version of Xcode. We had to update to 6.1.1 uh, beta when it came out, and if it hadn't come out, we wouldn't have been able to deploy our application. The compiler constantly segfaulted. It was just a nightmare trying to figure out what was going on until we finally realized that it was compiler optimizations being enabled that caused the compiler to crash. Xcode and SourceKit crashed all the time, and we really wanted to do testing because testing is good. 
but testing Swift code is very different than testing Objective-C code, and we struggled to find techniques to make it worthwhile. This, by and far, was the most frustrating part of writing Swift code last fall. Constant source kit crashes. All of your code highlighting disappears. Your autocomplete stops working. The keyboard shortcuts that you use to navigate between different parts of code no longer work the way they used to. It was not fun. All of this frustration and all of these problems led to one eventual outcome. We were not happy. We had to push as hard as we could in order to complete Eidolon on time, and it cost us. We did make our deadline, and, uh, and we're very happy with that because that's, you know, nothing is more important than shipping, but it cost us significant technical debt that we are still paying off today. It's not all doom and gloom. We helped pioneer a new way to write iOS software, and we shared it with everyone we could to make sure that you guys can learn from our mistakes. We created new libraries, tools, and resources for developers to use so that you don't make the same mistakes we did. Not only that, but we went out and we found other Swift tools that were being developed by other developers. We used them. We provided feedback. You should have this feature. This is a bug. Here's a fix for that bug. Finally, we learned a ton. We tried to share it with others on the Artsy blog. Someday very soon, the Apple tools are going to be ready for prime time, but it's not today. If you use them to write a significant Swift app in production, you will run into unanticipated problems. There will be no solutions for those problems because you will be the first person to ever encounter it. If that terrifies you, take that into account when you decide whether or not to use Swift. There are also third-party tools that we want to use. CocoaPods, Op.36, thanks to the heroic efforts of Marius, now supports frameworks in Swift. But CocoaPods is still pre-1.0, so use it with caution. Last November, we saw the introduction of a new dependency manager for iOS and OS X called Carthage. It's new but promising, and it's also a pre-1.0, so use it with caution. The most important thing that I want you to take away from this talk is that it is incredibly important for you to be well-informed. In order to make a choice about whether or not to use Swift, you need to consider a whole bunch of options. What is your aversion to risk? How hard is your deadline? Why are you building something? Is it because you enjoy writing software? Or is it because you need to get something out as quickly as possible? Finally, how open is your team to learning a new language? That's going to impact things. This kind of might lead you to think, why bother writing Swift? Objective-C is fine. We've been using it for years without issue. As I showed earlier, Swift is better than Objective-C, demonstrably. You can write safer code faster with fewer bugs, and that's great. You can feature-proof your code so that in five years when you're maintaining this legacy code base, you don't have to groan and say, oh, I have to drop down to Objective-C. It's so close to the metal. And uh, you, know, you can build a reputation. And, and I, I kind of joke about this, but if you're writing Swift code now, eight months after it was announced, you can really become the person who is known for writing Swift code. That sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? So how do you become a Swift expert? Well, there are a whole bunch of really easy ways to do it. It doesn't take as much effort as you might think. The first and most important is that you should be subscribing to community newsletters. Everything from GitHub Explore emails to the iOS Dev Weekly that Dave Verro runs, or Natasha the Robot has a really great Swift uh, newsletter that comes out every week. Read the Apple Swift blog, the official one. Subscribe to the RSS feed so you don't miss anything, because it's fantastic. You should read some books. There are several presenters at this conference who have written some great material on Swift that you can go out and read. Fantastic. Uh, you should regularly work with Swift. Try every once in a while to write a new class in Swift or open up a new playground to play around. If you don't try and experiment with Swift, you won't know when you're supposed to use it in production. Sometimes there are really fantastic ways that Swift lets you solve familiar problems in a better way. But if you don't have the experience with Swift, you won't know when to use them. And finally, look for those solutions and look for those problems because if you don't know about them, you'll never use them. I want to make one request, if I could. And I do this a lot. Pretty much every talk I give has a slide like this. Uh, I'd like you to write a blog. I really would. 
uh, writing is one of the most valuable things that you can do in order to learn because nothing will make sure that you understand something from a comprehensive, holistic level than trying to teach others. It solidifies your understanding of something and it preserves that knowledge for later. That's actually incredibly valuable because I've come across instances where I'm Googling for something and I find a result that's exactly what I need and I realize it's one of my own blog posts or it's an answer that I wrote on Stack Overflow three years ago. I'd forgotten all about it, but now I have that knowledge preserved somewhere. The next time that a new junior developer joins your company, you can point to a, a list of blog articles and say, this is what you need to know to get up and running with our code base. That's really valuable. That's a good business decision. And if you write a developer blog as part of your day-to-day -day job at your business, that is really good for business because all of a sudden you're the company that's an expert in Swift and you can never, ever have too much reputation. So yeah, there are some risks. There's also a lot of rewards. You know, we've looked at how you can write better code with Swift, faster code with Swift, but every developer, every developer team is responsible for making their own informed decision. You need to know Swift to know whether or not to use Swift. So be aware. And most importantly, don't be afraid to revisit your decision. If you start a project in Swift and you are struggling to make it work, then start over again, throw it away. This crab with an injured arm tears it off to grow a new one later on because he knows that that arm is just not for him. <laughs> to recap, yes, Swift is awesome, but the tools are immature, so it's up to you to be well informed. You need to know Swift in order to be informed. So, in conclusion, make an informed choice. In order to make that choice, you have to know Swift, so start now. Thank you.